Joshua chapter 24 all summer long. We've been doing this series called Take the Land. Take the Land, based out of the book of Joshua. And, and, and Joshua is, is, is an amazing, amazing man of God, a, a man of faith. The Bible, the Bible tells us that, that Moses would go into the secret place to, to meet with God and, and that he would come out of the tent. He would come out of that place of meeting with God and he'd go back to talk to the people. But the Bible says that Joshua would stay behind and he would stay at the door of the temple, the door of the tent right there, the entryway, and that he would, he would stay and linger in the presence of God. The Bible tells us that Joshua was a, a man of war, that he was a man who knew how to fight for, for the things of God. He, he knew how to contend for things of, that God had declared. We, we learned that Joshua was a servant. We, we know so many things about Joshua. And now Joshua, in the, in, in the beginning of the book of Joshua, we learned that it's his time. It's his time to lead. I, I want to speak to our graduates for just a moment that you've studied for 52 weeks, you've, you've come to the class, you've, you've done all the work, the school, our, our leaders, our disciples, that, that there comes a moment when it has to go from the paper to your life, that it can't just be information, but you have to walk in the revelation of who God is, amen? That as a leader, you've been given influence, and the influence is not for you to sit back and watch things happen, but it's so that you can use that influence, amen, to make things happen for the kingdom of God, amen? And so Joshua, Joshua here in Joshua 24, he's at the end of his life. He's at the end of, 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 of battles. It's been a season of war. It's been a season of conquest. It's, it's been a season of just pursuing after the things of God. And he's in a beautiful place right now because he's nearing the end of his life. And, and he, he, has the, he has the opportunity to look back and to see what God has done. But he also has the opportunity to see what God is doing in his present. But he has an opportunity to look forward. And I believe that that's a healthy way of living. To look back and to be grateful for what God has done. Amen. But to understand that, that what God did yesterday, that he can do today and even do greater things. Amen. And to appreciate what God is doing today. And then to look forward and to say, but there are greater days. Come on, somebody say greater days. There are greater days ahead. And so he... He comes to this portion of scripture and he's, it's, it's like his final declaration. And I want us to see these verses in Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15. And if you've been in the church for a while, you may have heard some of these phrases. If you haven't heard these phrases, you're going to become familiar with them as I preach on them today. But in honor of God's word, can we stand today? And we're going to read two verses. We're going to pray. And we're going to get into it. And it says this. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worship when they live beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. Say that with me. Serve the Lord alone. One more time. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the God your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family... But as for me and my family, come on, say that with me. But as for me and my family, finish it, we will serve the Lord. Somebody give God a praise today like you're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. God, over these next few moments, speak to our hearts. Lord, we want to hear from you. Everything that you have for us, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everyone says, amen. You may be seated today. It's a powerful statement. He's, he's at the end of his life. He's at the end of his life, and, and, and Joshua, Joshua is no longer thinking about and dreaming about what God has promised him. He's actually walking in what God has promised him. He's seeing it. He's tasting it. He's touching it. He, he, he's, he has possession of what God has given him. I want you to think about that for just a moment. There, there are moments in our lives, for those of us who have put our faith in Christ, there are moments in our lives where God makes us a promise, that he, he reveals something to us, that he, he promises something to us. Maybe that's revealed through the word. Maybe he downloads something into our spirit. Maybe it's something that we hear. Maybe in our prayer time, God comes to us and he says, here's a promise that I'm making you. Maybe that has to do with your children, or maybe that has to do with your marriage, or maybe that has to do with a dream that he stirs in you. Many years ago, you guys know this, that many years ago, God promised my wife and I children when we had no children. 
and all we had was a promise, right? It's one thing to have a promise, but it's another thing to walk in the fulfillment of that promise. And see, I believe that as we've been talking about taking the land, it's one thing to have a promise from God and to hold on to a promise from God, but it's another thing to have the promise, to see the fulfillment of the promise. God doesn't want to just tease you with the promise. He's a good God who wants to fulfill all of his promises. Somebody say amen. And so Joshua, Joshua's no longer thinking about the promised land. He's living in it. He's possessed it. He's building his family. The God, the, uh, God's nation, his people are being built up in the promised land. So it's, it's not something that they're hoping for. It's something that they have. And so Joshua comes to this moment at the end of his life. And, and, and he's over 100 years old by this time. And, and he's weak and he's tired. But he makes this amazing, powerful statement in verse 15. He says, but as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. See, I believe that that's a powerful statement. And, and we're going to say that, that statement over and over again in this message. But I want to give you three lessons that we can learn from this statement. Something that we can learn from, from Joshua, right? And the first is, is that Joshua makes a commitment to never forget. Look at your neighbor and say, never forget. Come on, look at your other neighbor and say, never forget. The Bible says again, I want you to say this with me. Verse 15, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. One more time. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. When Joshua makes this statement, what he is saying to the world, what he is saying to his people is that I'm never going to forget what God has done for me. I mean, think about this. They have everything that God has promised them. They've occupied, they've taken possession of the land. And Joshua is saying, listen, I know we're in the land. We have the land. We're building our families. We're building the nation. But I'm never going to forget that it was God who got us to this place. I'm never going to forget where God brought us out of. I'm never going to forget that he brought us out of Egypt. I'm never going to forget that he was with us through the desert. I'm never going to forget that he helped us conquer Jericho, that he helped us overcome the giants in the land. I'm never going to forget that it's not by our own effort that we have what we have, but it is because of God. God gets all the glory. God gets all the praise. God gets all the honor. Come on, praise him. Praise him like God has been good to you. They occupied and they took possession. But Joshua says, listen, I'm never going to forget that the only reason we have what we have, it's not because of our effort. It's not because of what we did. It's not because of what we accomplished. If we did anything, it was because God has been good. See, how many of you know that, that many of us were tested in life, that our, that, that our faithfulness to God, that our loyalty to God will be tested in life. And a lot of times, listen to me very carefully, a lot of times people think that when we go through hardship and then we go through crisis and we go through difficult time, tumultuous times, problems and drama, we think that that's the test of our, we think that that's going to be a test of our loyalty to God. But can I tell you something today? That it's not hardship, it's not poverty, it's not problems and tribulation that test our loyalty to God. But I believe that the real test is prosperity. It's when we're good. It's when we have what we need. It's when we have money in the bank. It's when we get the promotion that we've been praying for. It's when we, when we didn't have any money and we got money. It's when we didn't have a honey and God gave us a honey. Come on, somebody. It's when, it's when all of a sudden, everything that we've asked for, God gave us. And now all of a sudden, watch this. It's easy to hold on to God when you're desperate and you have nothing, when you're broke, busted, and disgusted. Come on, somebody. It's easy to hold on because you have nothing else to. But watch this. Can you hold on to God when he begins to answer your prayers? Can you hold on to God when he gives you the desires of your heart? Can you hold on to God when you're walking in the promised land? Can you hold God, hold on to God when he gave you that marriage, when you gave you that family, when you gave you that house, when you gave you that promotion, when you gave you that job? Can you still hold on to God? And that's where Joshua says, listen, all that I have, all this land, all this territory, he says, it's all good. But he's, he's saying this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm not going to forget where this came from. 
Huh? Some of you, you came to Lifeway many years ago. Your life was on the brink. You were anxious. You were depressed. Your marriage was on the brink of destruction. Your family was falling apart. You had questions. Maybe you struggled with addictions. Maybe you've made so many mistakes and you came here broken. You came here and you were, you were desperate for God and, and you reached out to him and in your cry, he heard you. But now, now you're living in the promised land. And my question to you is, will you forget who brought you here? Over the years, as a pastor, on many occasions, I've had people come up to me and say, Pastor, would you pray for me for this? Pastor, I, I need this breakthrough in my life. Pastor, would you help me pray in this area? Or Pastor, would you pray, would you pray that, that God would supply the job or the promotion that I need to be able to provide for my family? And we pray and we believe. And I'm, I'm sad to say that many times, not all the times, but many times, the very thing that you've been praying for, the very thing that the people were praying for, is the very thing that kept them from being loyal to God. Lord, give me that job. Lord, I need that job. Lord, help me get that job. God gives them the job. And now all of a sudden the job now becomes a hindrance for them to serve the Lord. Well, I can't go because I'm, I've got a job. Well, how is it that the thing that God blessed you with is now the thing that's keeping you from God? It's not that God gave you something wrong. It's just that you're using it wrong. You're not being faithful to the Lord. You were grateful for the job, but now you're not faithful after serving the Lord. See, the Bible says in Psalms 77, verse 11 and 12, I like what it says in the message translation. I don't usually use the message translation. I thought I would use this one today. It says this, once again, I'll go over what God has done. For, can you do that for just a moment? Just, I want everybody for just a moment. Close your eyes right there where you're at. This is not a trick. No one's looking through your wallet or your purse right now, ladies, amen? But for just a moment, close your eyes for just a moment. And just for just a couple of seconds, think about what God has done for you. Think about how good he's been to you. Think about how he loves you. All right. Watch this. Once again, look at me. I'll go over what God has done. Lay out on the table the ancient wonders and I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished. And I give a long loving look at your acts. Think about it for just a moment. If you could go to your dining room table and begin to spread out sheets of paper and, and, and be able to write down all the things that God has done for you, could you ever stop? I know I couldn't. I know I would probably be there for days. And, and, and then once I finish, I'd probably be reminded of something else. The Bible says, once again, I'll go over what God has done and give a long look, a, lo a long loving look at your acts. See, a lot of times, instead of focusing on what God has done and remembering that it is God who did that for us, we, we tend to take the credit, don't we? Well, I worked so hard for this job and for this promotion. And, you know, I put in the extra hours and I went to school and I studied and I'm the one who got that master's degree and I'm the one who got that doctor's degree and I'm the one who pressed in and I'm the one who put in the overtime. And I would say this, who's the one who gave you the strength? Who's the one who opened the door? Who's the one who gave you that opportunity? Who's the one who gave you that gift? Who's the one who stirred that desire in you? Who was the one who helped you when you couldn't go on anymore, but God kept on pushing you, amen? Who's the one who never left you or, for, or forsaked you, amen? Who's the one who was always there in the good and the bad? Never forget. The Bible says in Psalms 103, verse 105, it says, Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Here it is. May I never forget. Say that with me. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. If God has been good to you, if God has been good to your marriage, if God has been good to your family, to your finances, to your life, if God has been good to this church, I want you for the next 15 seconds Give God a praise like he's been good to you. Amen. Come on, praise him for the Lord is good. I said for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. <laughs> Never forget. We can't forget church students. We can't forget. 
We can't forget what God has done, what God has, has put us through. We can't forget the lessons that he has taught us. We can't forget how he saved us. As I look at some of you here today, I know some of the hardships that you've had to go through. I know that even in this season of discipleship and leadership, some of you had life happen to you. You were blindsided. You were hit on every side. You were pressed. You were crushed. But you stayed faithful. You stayed loyal. God was with you. God is faithful. Never forget that it's he who helped you finish this. Amen. Never forget. Here's, here's point number two. He says this. He, when he says, you know, this statement, as for me and my family, we serve the Lord. What he's saying is this, is I'm going to finish strong. I'm going to finish strong. He says, I was strong when I served Moses. I was strong when I walked through the desert. I was strong when I crossed over into the promised land. I was strong when I led the armies into battle. And now here I'm at, at the end of my life. I'm old. I'm older. I'm wiser. Maybe a little slower. Maybe you don't have the strength that I had when I was younger. But you know what? I'm going to finish strong. I want us to read that verse again. Verse 15, it says with me, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Jo Josh was at the end of his life. He's at the end of his life, and, but he's determined to finish strong. He started strong, but he's going to finish stronger. Amen. He's not going to flake out at the end. He's not going to flake out toward the end of his life. So here we are in, at the end of July. How many of you remember when it was January 1st? Here we are seven months later. I can't believe this. We're less than five months to Christmas. Hello, somebody. We're less than five months to Christmas, and we're going to blink, and it's going uh, to it's gonna be September, and we're going to blink, and it's going to be October, and it's, we're going to blink again, and you're going to be inviting me to your Thanksgiving dinner. Amen? And blink, and you're going to be giving me a Christmas present. Hallelujah. And we're going to blink, and it's going to be 2025. And so... I thank God for what he's done at Lifeway Church in the last seven months. Seven months ago, you guys were, were parking in a temporary parking lot on the other side of the property. Seven months ago, our, here at the church, the, the property that was, had trenches all over the place. There was dirt everywhere. Seven months ago, we were meeting in the, the little building across. I, I walk in that building now, and I wonder how in the world did we sit 140 people in there? I don't know. I don't know how we had three services, 8.30, 10.30, 12.30, but we made it happen. I don't know how we got into this place. I don't know how we, we raised the money to be able to get into this place. All I know is that God has done amazing things. Can I give God praise? Amen. But I want you to know something, that the next five months are going to be a lot greater than the first seven months. You want to know why? Because I'm believing God for greater things. I believe that what's ahead of us is greater than what's behind us. And I've determined in my heart, I've determined in my heart that I'm going to finish stronger than how I started. I've told a story, and maybe you've heard this story, maybe you haven't. But many years ago, when I, before I was married, growing up in my, with my father and my mom, uh, we had a guest evangelist one time come to preach at our church. And the guest evangelist, came and he, he stayed at one of our members' house and, and they had a room and he stayed in the room. And this guest evangelist, he had a hobby. Uh, I particularly do not like this hobby. I think it's horrible, but hey, it helps people, right? He likes to jog. Come on, somebody, amen. <laughs> and I had a friend of mine who got hurt. Jog, he hurt himself jogging and that's why I don't jog. I don't want to hurt myself, amen, praise the Lord. But this gentleman, he liked to jog, and he liked to jog a lot. He would go running in the morning, jogging in the morning. He'd go five, seven, eight, ten miles. So the, the host that was hosting him, he was, he was like one of those macho guys. You know what I mean? Macho, he, I could do anything, and he's just like a macho guy. So he told the evangelist, he says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to go jogging. He goes, I can jog too. And he goes, okay, well, let's go jogging. So, so they went out there to a place to start jogging, and, and the, the, the guy from the church I mean, he didn't understand the difference between jogging and sprinting, right? So the evangelist started jogging. And when the guy from our church started running, he was like sprinting like a, like a bat out of Hades. Come on, somebody, amen? He like, shoo. And, and so the evangelist said, either this guy is really good or he's really foolish. And so the guy kept on jogging. And not even a half a mile later, the guy's killed over. 
and he's like sucking wind, he's throwing up, right? Because he wasn't ready for the job. See, don't tell me how well you started. Tell me how well you finish. Anybody, anybody can run fast the first six feet. Anybody can run fast the first couple of, you know, blocks. But can you, can you, can you finish strong? See? Strong in this year, strong in prayer, strong in the word, strong in your praise and worship, strong in service, strong in your giving, strong in sharing your testimony, your story with others, strong in your faith, strong in your marriage or your family. Are, are you willing to finish this year strong and say, well, well, pastor, what do I have to do? Well, you have to do the same thing that Joshua did. And what did he do? He made a choice. He says, today I'm choosing that as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. That, hey, I'm choosing. I'm making a decision. You know what I've noticed is that when you decide to do something, when someone decides this is what I'm going to do, they end up doing it. There's never an excuse. There's never a reason why not to do it. But when you make a decision, you are so focused and you say, I'm going to do this and you follow through with it. Now watch this. You have to make a decision today that I'm going to finish this year out strong. I'm not going to flake out. I'm not going to whimper. I'm going to go strong. Can I get an amen? You have to know this too, that as you, as you begin to move forward, the enemy will try to distract you. He'll try to get you off course. This is why the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, stay alert. In other words, he says, watch out. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, watch out. Come on. Come on. Give him a good little tap on the shoulder. Say, watch out. Come on, watch out. I said a tap, not a slap. Amen. Watch this. It says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Can I tell you something? Lifeway Church is not your enemy. This pastor is not your enemy. The worship team is not your enemy. The sound person who makes the sound thump in here and makes your chest go like this, maybe your no, it's not your enemy. Come on, somebody. We are not your enemy. Your in-laws are not your enemy. The life group leader who's been trying to get you to go to a life group is not your enemy. Faith who is asking you to sign up for school of discipleship and leadership is not your enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. Your coworker is not your enemy. The politicians in this, well, they're not our enemy either. Come on, somebody. You want to know who the enemy of your soul is? It's none other than Lucifer. I like to call him Lucy. Come on, somebody. The devil is your enemy. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So what ends up happening is a lot of times we isolate ourselves. A lot of times we get away from the family of faith. A lot of times we withdraw. A lot of times we step back. And it's when we're isolated that the enemy pounces on that. And guess what? He begins to attack us and he begins to lie to us and he begins to deceive us. Listen to what it says in verse 9. It says, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. I want to just, just highlight something on that verse. Is that when we withdraw and, and, and we decide not to finish strong, we isolate ourselves. And when we isolate ourselves, watch this, we all of a sudden feel like we're the only ones going through struggles. Have you ever felt that way? Like you get away from the family of faith. You, 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 for whatever reason, you, you've drifted away from faith and you haven't been to church in eight weeks. And all of a sudden you're like, well, nobody's called me. And nobody knows what I'm going through. And nobody knows my struggles. And all of a sudden you start singing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And all of a sudden, you, you throw a little pity party because you feel all alone. But wait a minute, how did you get there? No one pushed you away. No one told you to step away. No one said, get away from me. No, you decided to isolate yourself. You decided to pull back. And in that isolation, the enemy, the enemy capitalized on it, pounces on you, deceives you. And then all of a sudden you fall into this rut, into this place where nobody else is struggling like me. That's the biggest lie. Join the club. The problem is, is that you decided to do it on your own. And guess what? In the family of faith, we decided to rely on each other. Well, it's because it's nobody knows. Well, how can they know if you never tell them? 
Well, it's because I don't know anybody. That's why we have life groups. Well, I don't need a life group. Well, then stay alone. Come on. We got life groups. Life groups are necessary so that you can get connected and so that people can pray with you and love you and hold you account of, accountable and be there for you in your struggles. But if you don't get connected to one, don't complain when the care and the fellowship isn't happening in your life because you've decided that you don't need it. It starts with a decision. You say, well, I haven't done life groups this year. We still got five months. And by the way, you can start this week. See, here's the third and last point. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hit that one anymore, all right? I'm just going to leave that one alone. Here's the third one. Here's the, what I love is that Joshua says, and he makes this commitment that I'm not going to do faith alone. He says, I'm not going to do faith alone. Let's read that verse one more time. But as for me and my family, we will. Okay. You see. One of the challenges of a, I grew up, I grew up as a, a pastor's child. My father was a pastor. I grew up in the church. I, didn't, I don't know anything but the church, okay? I've, I've been going to church since I was probably born, right? So every Sunday, I'm at church for the most part. One of the challenges of a pastor is this, and I saw this from, with my father and my mother, but it's also myself, listen, is that as pastors, we try to be there for everybody else, we try to be there for all the hurting and the broken when sometimes we neglect the ones who are hurting and broken in our own home. I'm just being honest. It's not intentional. It's not because we're bad parents or, or I'm a bad pastor or anything like that or my dad didn't do his due diligence. No, 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 it's not that. It's that we're so busy helping others and loving others and doing ministry that we sometimes forget as pastors that my number one ministry is not to Lifeway Church. My number one ministry is not even my children. My number one ministry is my wife. My second number... My second ministry is my children. And the third ministry is all of y'all. I love all y'all, just not more than my children and my wife. You wouldn't want a pastor who neglects his wife. You wouldn't want a pastor who ignores his kids. You need a pastor, by, I say this in humility, who models what it is to be a good husband and to be a good father. Not a perfect one, because Lord knows I'm not perfect. You can ask my children, and you can ask my wife. Don't say too much. <laughs> but I am being perfected, and I am being made in the image of God, in the Christ, excuse me. And guess what? I'm being more Christ-like, and I'm trying to do my best to make sure that I'm not doing this thing called faith alone. That what does it profit that I preach in Buckeye every weekend. What does it profit that I win all these people to Jesus? Praise God for the honor and glory of God. What does it profit that I, that I preach to the nations of the earth? What does it profit that this stream is going out and touching so many people? What does it all that profit if my kids want nothing to do with me and my wife isn't very happy with me? I've decided that my number one ministry is my wife, that my number two ministry is my children. And that my number three ministry is this. Now, I work hard for this. I pray for this. I weep for this. I intercede for this the way I do that for my family. But what I'm wanting to get to you today is I want to talk for just a moment as we get ready to close here to all the moms and dads in this place. And I don't care if it's a traditional family. What's a traditional family? It's a family that's the same uh, father and mother for all the kids. In other words, mom and dad got married and they have, like Rosie and I, we got four kids and two dogs and a cat. Come on, somebody. That's a traditional family. A blended family is what? Is when, 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 when the husband brings in kids from a previous relationship and the wife brings in kids from a previous relationship and now all of a sudden there's a stepmom, stepfather, stepchildren. That's a blended family. This is not a family lesson, by the way. Then you have a you have a single parent family. You have a mom raising her kids or you have a father raising the children. That's a single parent. Regardless of what, what family you have today, I do know this is that God ordained moms and dads to be the leader of their homes. I know this too, that God never ordained the kids to be the leaders. Come on, someone say amen. 
So y'all are brave in here. Amen. But you can get out in the parking lot and you're like, where do you want to go, sweetie? Wait, wait a minute. I thought you were the leader. Huh? Like everything revolves around the kids. Your schedule around the kids. The kids decide where you're going to go on vacation. The kids decide where you're going to go eat. The kids decide as they get older if they're, if they're supposed to go to church or not. Then you wonder when they get into the teenagers why they fight you so much and they get so stubborn. It's because you let them be like that since they were children. And now they're 14 and 15 and you say, come on, we're going to church. I don't feel like going to church. And you don't want to fight that battle, so you let them make their own choices. And then you wonder why they're ruined when they're 20 and 21 years old. And you're trying to, oh, pastor, pray for it. You should have been doing that when they were two and three. And, and it's never too late to start, please. It's never too late to start. Come on. But you're going to have to be the leader. Not the follower. Let me say it in Spanish. Tus hijos no te mandan. <laughs> Some of the Spanish people are like, Hallelujah, Gloria a Dios, Pastor. <laughs> In other words, your kids don't tell you what to do. You are the leader. God designed you to be the leader. God said you are the one in charge of this home. You are the leader. Come on, somebody say amen. Some of you don't like what I'm saying right now, but it's the truth. I'm just preaching truth. Joshua said, but as for me, and he says, I'm not doing this alone, and my family. You got to choose that every day of your life. You got to choose that on, on, on Sundays. And by the way, every day of your life, you need to, like you say, well, pastor, it's because there's a lot of drama before we get to uh, Sundays, and I just don't want the drama. That's why you got to come against the drama on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And then on Saturday, you say, get your clothes ready, get everything ready, because in the morning, we're going to get up, because as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. But I don't want to go. Oh, you're going to go. If you want to eat tomorrow, you're going. You want a snack, you're, getting, you're going. Like all of a sudden, you've got this, you've got a tyrant at the age of five years old. They're, they're acting like a dictator in the, in the house. Like they're the ones in charge. And you're at their mercy. But as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. And listen, I, I fully understand, look. As a pastor, my kids aren't perfect. I've said this, and I'm not perfect. And there's many a times that I've had to go to them because I've made some mistakes. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I maybe responded in ways that I shouldn't have responded. I've told my son Micah and Jared and, and my daughters, Georgiana and Faith, there's many times where I have done something, and afterwards I'm like, I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and I say, you know what? I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have responded that way. I'm sorry. But that doesn't mean that I'm not the leader. It just means that I can humble myself when I make mistakes. Don't do faith alone. Some of you need to make that choice. Hey, you know what? The rest of this year, as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my family, we're going to go to school discipleship. As for me and my family, we're going to go to that night of worship. As for me and my family, we're going to go to prayer. Come on. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Come on. Somebody praise God like you're going to serve the Lord. Amen. All right. Worship team, come on up. Come on, we're going to close right now. Has this been good? Has this been blessing you today? Amen? All right. At least clap, fake it, all right, if it has been blessing you. No, it's been good. I want to close with this verse in Joshua 24, verse 31. In fact, everyone stand with me because if you don't stand, I'm going to keep on preaching. It says, Joshua 24, verse 31, it says this. The people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him. Those who had personally experienced, everybody say experienced. Those who had personally experienced all that the Lord had done for Israel. In other words, the people who experienced God, the people who had a personal encounter with God, those are the ones who stayed faithful. I want you to know something that an encounter with God will change you. An encounter with God, with God will begin to transform you. Everything changes when you have this experience, this encounter with God. The Bible says 
that as they experienced God, that those people remain faithful. If you're here today, and maybe you struggle with your faithfulness, maybe sometimes you're hot, sometimes you're cold, and, and depending on what you're going through, you're on fire for God, or, or you need to be on fire for God. And it's up and down. You want to know what that tells me? It tells me that you're not maintaining an experience with God. You're not maintaining a relationship with God. Because when you have that relationship, when you have that encounter time with God, it will cause you to stay faithful. It will cause you to stay loyal. It will cause you to stay on fire. Why? Because as I love the Father, He loves me, and I want to please the Father. I know that sounds, maybe sounds a little bit strange for some of you. I, you're talking to me, Pastor, like he's a real person. He is a real person. He is a real person who desperately wants to have a relationship with you. And today, maybe, maybe you're here and you've never encountered Jesus. Maybe you had an encounter with religion. Maybe you've had an encounter with a church or a pastor. Maybe something that you heard moved you, but it didn't really change you. I'm not asking you to have an encounter with religion or a church. I'm asking you to have an encounter with Jesus today. That will change you. That will take you from death to life, from darkness to light, from hopeless to hopeful, from sinner to forgiven. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. We hope you're blessed by today's video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow our social media platforms in the description below. God bless.